Welcome to Candy's Car Corner. I'm your host, Candy Mitten. In this series, we're going to meet some great classic car owners. Next up is going to be Larry Gullison. He lives in Fredericton and he's a local businessman. He's going to tell us about his love of cars and his experience at the International Targa Race in Newfoundland. Now, is this the car that you actually used to race in Targa and what is it? This is the car. This is the SVT, Special Vehicle Team Builds Them. That's what SVT stands for. And it's a 1988 Contour. They don't build them now. What inspired you to take the jump and actually register for the Targa Newfoundland race? One of the most famous rally races in the world. How would you define Targa racing? Targa is, is a name. That's a name for rally racing. And rally racing in Newfoundland is that they have predetermined courses that they spec out during the year. They put every corner, every bump, every crossroad or whatever on it, and they put distance to it, and they put time between each point. And then they draw the maps, and they give us each of those maps for all these different races. And then that's how your navigator comes in. You have to meet every checkpoint on time in order to finish on time. Mm -hmm. If you miss one turn, you're, 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 you're not going to make it on time. And that's how you get the coveted plate at the end. The medallion you get around your neck, the target medallion they give you when you come back on Friday afternoon, when you, fin you get that for finishing every, every stage. Okay. And uh, that was wonderful. It, 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 you know, that's, that's just priceless. The silver plate, the target plate, the, t you know, the coveted target plate with all the information on it, which we've got one, so you, you can put your own value on that. I put a great value on it myself. Certainly the target race, there's only one in Canada, and it's in Newfoundland, and I believe there's two others in the world. I know one is in Australia, and there's different divisions, like I said, fast, slow, and big and small. And actually, they fly their cars in from all over the world there, or, or they come by, by boat. Richard Drummond, again, he, you're going to hear that name a lot in my life in vehicles. Uh, he built that vehicle, and I went to uh, Newfoundland in 2012. Uh, we were gone 17 days. The number of my car is 62 because I was 62 starting my racing career. And it was uh, so much fun. I guess I do have some natural talent because uh, I, my, my navigator, was uh, Greg Turner from Moncton, who had the car show in Moncton. A lot of people knew Greg. Do I notice some electronics or controllers in there on the dash? Well, the electronics and controllers, that's, that's for your navigator. That's why I say he never has to look up. He went with me as navigator experienced, and uh, we, we won our division that year, which is really something. It really, really is something. And uh, I can only remember the one highlight was uh, we were headed for the ocean on about a 28 kilometer run and we we're going real steep incline and all you see out of peripheral vision is big red big boulders <laughs> headed for the coast no trees and gray says don't ease up it's straight on the other side and when we hit the top of the peak the car took a little air and i can still feel my stomach today that was the <laughs> thrill of a lifetime of scare so give me an idea of some of the modifications you had to make to this Ford Contour in order to be able to race in Targa. Well actually uh, the whole suspension has changed underneath it. The sway bars and the, and the brakes. This is big brakes. These are the same brakes we, we raced on our stock car. We practice on Sunday and you start Monday morning 8 o'clock. You show up for your first stage they call it. And uh, well, actually at 7 o'clock you, you do a breathalyzer every day in order to race and you, you show up at eight to race. They have different stages. Some of them are three kilometers, some are 28. You do six to seven races a day and you travel between towns. Mm -hmm. And in Newfoundland, they shut that whole town down for the day. And uh, actually, why they do that is it brings in 12 to $13 million a year to Newfoundland over that period of a week. Mm -hmm. But uh, the whole town comes out, they stand, they cheer you on. My only concern, and having an accident was we were racing right on the edge of the coast all the time on the water. No guardrails. So they teach you, they teach you and tell you what to do if you go in the water. You're supposed to hang upside down in your car until the car fills full of water. And then roll the window down and get out. Well, I'm glad I never had to experience <laughs> that. I was in the target division, which is the fast division. 
obviously that's what I like to do is go fast. Now what inspired you to get into rally racing? You mentioned when you originally bought the SVT, that was your plan. I like rally racing and I think there's going to be more of it because that's what we all do. Now this is a very unique vehicle and I noticed it's all black. Yes. Tell me why this Ford truck is so special. This Ford truck is, is special. It's a 1999 and when it was built by Ford, it was the fastest production pickup ever manufactured. So even though you have many vehicles around, tell us which ones you'll actually be taking to Frex Rod this year. I'm going to take a, a 1951 Ford tractor, and, and uh, they knew about this. It wasn't me taking it. They requested it. Tell me a little bit about it. We had a little hobby farm in Maidsville, so we never used it much. And when my father passed, I acquired the tractor, and uh, I just wanted to restore it because that's what we do. I, I, as a kid, I used it all the way through the farm, and farm for neighbors and so on, so I grew up with it as well. Now you're getting ready to restore the car that's behind you. Mm -hmm. Give me an idea from point A to point B what it's going to take to get it to something that you can put in a future Frex rod. Well, when you do these vehicles nowadays, uh, the quality is, is li like you see on television all the time. No one's interested unless you take it to that degree, so we will dismantle the car. It's completely dismantled and you redo the frame and then you just start building from there and the engine and so on. But uh, I am going to make a couple of changes because these cars were known for poor brakes, poor mechanical <laughs> brakes. So I'll put the modern disc brakes on and I'll do one more thing. I'll, I'll put air conditioning in because we're so spoiled today. Maybe a little chip in the engine, give it a few more horsepower because this one only has 85 horsepower. So that's the only changes I'll make. Other than that, it'll, it'll look just like it was when it was new. Now we're just talking about restoring cars, like what you're going to do to this fine specimen behind us. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, we've got Frex Rod coming up in the next couple of weeks here in Fredericton. And there are lots of vehicles that have been taken to pristine condition. Mm -hmm. And last year, one of your vehicles mm -hmm. won Best in Show, the highest honor that you can be bestowed. Yes. Tell us about that vehicle. That vehicle you're talking about, it's a 1938 Ford F100 half ton mm -hmm. that I purchased on the board of Alberta, Saskatchewan. It was a, a five-year project, mostly for monetary work and the enjoyment of doing, doing it at your own pace. The main builder of that, who everyone knows in the city, was Richard Drummond. And I've known Richard since high school, and if anyone has the love of, of a vehicle, it's Richard. So he headed it up, and uh, I gathered parts and money and, and uh, did, did the labor and the grunt work, and my grandson also worked on it for five years. It came out very, very nice. It's, uh, well, obviously it got best in show last year, and, and that, that just helps enhance my, my hobby, I guess, to keep going forward. So I'm really looking forward to taking it back this year. Try to explain to us what kind of friends you can make, whether it's at car shows, at the stock car track, at the drag car track. Th is, there, is there a special bond between car people? All of them have the love of the vehicle, one way or another, for one use or another, I guess, uh, or they wouldn't be there. <laughs>
uh, aluminum heads. So I notice over here there's a red box you don't see in most vehicles. Is that something special and what is it? Yeah, it's uh, an MSD box and that looks after all of your electrical. Now, you've had this car for a lot of years and you've used it for a few different things. Tell us what kinds of fun things you might do with this car. Um, we go to cruise the Dairy Queen a lot <laughs> through the week. We go to car shows, um, race it. Uh, raced it since 95, started in Penfield and and uh, raced there and then went on to Miramichi Dragway. So yeah, I drive it one to two times a week. Like I don't try not to let it sit because what's the point? And uh, yeah, we have a, we cruise around with a lot, yeah. Now you've mentioned car shows. Tell me why you enjoy taking your car to Frex Rod. Um, I think it gets a lot of attention, not just for racing, but just for that, you know, car enthusiast anyway. Um, I like to see the kids get involved because, you know, they're into other things now too. So it's nice to see them go back to kind of old school stuff and, and uh, yeah, it just gets an interest for, for other people that might not have an interest in it. And for all the people that don't know you and your husband, Chris, he does have his own car. Yeah. And this is your car. Yes. Now, it's still not that common for females to own cars like this. Do you get any comments or looks when you're in this car? Even when I'm sitting in the car still, if they don't know me, once they know me, then they, and they'll come up and say to Chris, oh, that's a nice car. And I'm like, it's hers. And I'm like, I'm sitting in it. <laughs> like, <laughs> And I had a, I had a ran into a friend one time at a car show and her husband was there and she knew it was my car. And he said, oh, she said, this is, this is my, my hairstylist car. And he said, it is. I'm like, yeah. He said, whose name is on the registration? And I said, mine. So I don't think he actually believed that it was my car, but I mean, lots of girls have cars. <laughs> and speaking of things that girls, women don't often do and drag racing. Yep. Why did you want to get into drag racing? Um, my husband was first when I first met him. He had a Dart 76 Dart Sport and, and uh, went to Penfield and raced it. And uh, I watched that for a couple of years and then I thought I don't really want to watch anymore. I'd like to try it myself and, and started out in a sportsman class and uh, like, you know, totally street car and, and then just worked my way up from there. And what kind of success have you had at drag racing? I've won a few you know, a few trophies. Uh, first year in Penfield, I won a nostalgia race. And the first time I went up to Dragway, or Miramichi Dragway, the first race I actually went in, which was Sportsman, I actually won the very first time I was there. And and I didn't realize there was points races and stuff like that. So all these guys were shaking my hand because I had taken out the points leader and I wasn't really <laughs> sure what that meant, but they were all happy that I showed up, the guys that were in, you know, second, third and fourth place. So it was, it was kind of neat. How long was it before you really felt that comfort level, whether it's with this car or any other car? Um, I would, I'm really used to my car and I think it helped that I started out at a, a slower time mm -hmm. and worked my way up. So you, you get used to how the car works and what it does. Now, this is a beautiful color on this car. Tell me, is this a special color paint? Yeah, this, came, this car color came out in 1970. So the car is a 70 and um, they came out with a, a few different, like there was Lime Ricky and this is Plum Crazy, there's uh, Panther Pink, and they came out with that line in 1970. So I kind of, back when I painted, there weren't a lot of purple cars. Um, it's originally uh, yellow, and the guy that painted had a hard time not paint. He's more of an original guy, mm. so all he said when he got it done was, that's a lot of purple. And that was it, but I, re I really liked the color and I mean, now you see a lot of purple cars. Give us an idea of, even though there was a ding in the side, <laughs> some of the other th hurdles that you had to overcome to get the car from what it looked like when you bought it down in Minnesota to this. It was a year and a half at the body shop. Um, it's got two new quarters, uh, the fender's different. My a new, two new rockers, but my the guy that did the body work didn't like the way the new one fits so he actually made a rocker panel and his actually fit quite nice um and then so we took it home in about march on a flatbed but it had no motor no transmission the interior did you guys do that or did it come complete um we had no uh there was an old interior so when you say you did the interior what exactly does that mean 
um, the interior that's in it now, we had actually had a, another 70 dart swinger um, that the frame had gone in. So we took, it was like a diamond tuck. Okay. So we took that out and uh, it used to have a uh, bench seat. We put in bucket seats mm -hmm. and because uh, it was a standard. So we've, we've changed a little bit. Try to tell me how important that car is and why. Um, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's unique, I guess, still for, for a girl to have a car like that. I guess I anything that I do with it, um, I, I just really enjoy it. Welcome back to Candy's Car Corner. I'm your host, Candy Mitten. Now, in our final part of this show, we're going to make a pit stop at Richard Drummond's garage. Now, Richard has been a common denominator amongst many of our classic car collectors. Richard, this is a beautiful red Corvette. Tell me about this car and what it is you're doing to it. Just had a few little uh, imperfections in the paint, so I'm taking a few marks out of it. I started out building street rods. Mm -hmm. I built myself a street rod. It's on the wall over there. It was a 34 Ford with a 351 Cleveland supercharged. And uh, when I got that thing done, uh, people started coming asking me to do things and, and I never really stopped after that it just they just kept coming through the door wanting something done so now I, is this what you studied for is this the career you set out with I became an electrician and went to trade school in St. Andrews and mm -hmm. become an electrician and and I worked at that for a while and then I got into the sign business and uh so I manufactured signs for 39 years, but I worked in my garage at nights and weekends. And way back in the, in the 70s, uh, I got into drag racing and you would know, you learn a lot about everything when you're doing that. So body work, I was just, I just liked it. So when you start one of these jobs and you take it from the very beginning to the very end and then you watch the owner as they drive away so happy in whatever you've created or people are coming up to them going, oh, who painted your car? It's beautiful. What kind of pride does that give you? It makes me feel really good. I, I have... I have a lot of pride. Now we're going back in time here a little bit. Tell me about this car and what you've done to it so far. It's a 68 SSRS, which is a little bit rare, and being a convertible. So I painted it and put it together to what you can see. I, I, I mean, I've done a quite a bit of restoration stuff, mm -hmm. but I would sooner be modifying something. So out of all the projects that you've had to work on, which one was your absolute favorite? Um, my first car that I actually built, the, the one on the wall there, the 34 Ford. Uh, I didn't have a car, I didn't have anything. I, all I, I just knew that I wanted a street rod mm -hmm. and I wanted to make it myself. And uh, put the thing together and um, it, was, it was good, it was a good car. And like I said, it, it gave me work for 20 years really that that one car well it's a custom built truck made for hauling water for various things but there's a pump in here to fill the tank if you're filling out of a brook or whatever so in all the years that you've been working on different types of vehicles and some of them being older you must run into a few snags that uh, cause you to become puzzled on how to fix it how do you overcome that um, I wake up in the middle of the night with the answer I, I can't tell you how many times that I woke up at two or three o'clock in the morning with a solution to whatever I was doing. And uh, I have some really good friends that are uh, uh, helpful a lot of times if I, if I am in a mess. But uh, for the most part, I, I wake up in the middle of the night with the answer and I can't tell you how. Now, one of the big projects that you recently did was Larry Gullison's truck. What kind of pride does it bring you to know that at the end, it was the best? It, it's good. Um, 
It's, that's not the first time that that's happened. Larry's truck was uh, unique. Um, it was in the woods over in uh, close to Miramichi, and he kept saying, well, I want that and I want that. So that's how his truck ended up like it is. When you take something to Richard, he does the whole thing. Mm -hmm. He does the complete, and then he, he paints it besides. So he's the full deal, and he's, he's high quality on all levels, and uh, he just loves doing it. How long would a project like that take you? It was over a three year or three and a half year period that I worked at it, mm -hmm. off and on. Now we've seen some of Mike Greer's vehicles when we were over in his garage. Which of those might you have done some work on? The first one was a 66 uh, Chev Impala, dark blue. And the next one was a, a 56 Packard. Uh, when it got here, I thought he'd lost his mind. But uh, he, he was determined, and I guess maybe I was too. I had it off the frame and on a rotisserie. The bottom of that car looks just the same as the top. And, uh, and I did everything to it. When you t lift the body off of a frame, you've got to be really careful that the door jams don't close up or move. Uh, okay. Because it's not, it was never designed to be like this as opposed to like this. That car I had, it, I had every piece of it apart uh, and back together. And then I did a GTO for him. Do you accept every job you get offered? No. No, I've turned down the odd one. What's the furthest away someone has come to get work from Richard Drummond? Uh, Presque Isle, Maine. I, I do uh, stainless steel exhaust systems. So you mentioned that someone came all the way from Presque Isle, Maine just to get you to do work on their vehicle. How do you think word gets around so strongly to come see Richard Drummond? Oh, it's just a car, the car thing. A car people talk to car people. Tell me about this car again. It's a 2014 GT500 Shelby. It um, has a supercharged uh, 355 cubic inch motor, 662 horsepower. When you go to any car show, whether it's the local Frex Rod or shows outside of the province, wherever, someone with your eye, tell me the types of things that you look for or at as you check out all of the vehicles. I, I look at something that would be hard to do or mm -hmm. something that somebody really thought hard about before they did it. So from a personal aspect, what kinds of things do you just like to see? May not be the most expensive, may not even be the best quality, but you, Richard, really, you seek them out at a car show. Uh, I like street rods, uh, probably best of all, but I also like a a really good uh, uh, Mustang or Camaro. Knowing that you've spanned quite a few years of doing this, even if we just go back to 89, you've still been doing it for you know, 20, 30 years. How hard is it to keep up with everything that's going on? Uh, today, not hard because of the internet and, uh, and you can go on. Um, you can find pretty near anything you want, and not only that, but you can get a YouTube a video of the guy putting it on, taking it off, and painting it or whatever. Well, you've certainly given us a lot of information today, and I'm sure you're going to get maybe a few more phone calls about people wanting to know if Richard Drummond can redo their car. Well, that would be a good thing, I guess.